I think most of you know that Human Rights Watch is one of the most storied names in the world of human rights advocacy. Um, and Brad Adams has been an important figure in that world for roughly two decades. Brad became the executive director of Human Rights Watch Asia Division in 2002, and he currently oversees that organization's efforts in more than 20 countries. He's worked on a range of issues, including freedom of expression, protection of human and civil rights defenders, counterterrorism, gender, and religious discrimination. And there's a much longer list on the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, pamphlets, but I'll, I'll stop with that. Um, so writing on these and other topics, he's been an important voice in our public sphere as a contributor to publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, Foreign Affairs, and the Wall Street Journal. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, Brad worked in Cambodia as a lawyer with the UN High Commission for Human Rights and as a legal advisor to the Cambodian Parliament. And in his spare time, when he's not doing that, Brad teaches international human rights law and practice at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, I, we're delighted to be able to welcome him to Seattle and to the UW, and particularly in the context of Human Rights Watch expansion of their office in Seattle. So I think what you're going to see today is hopefully only the first of many productive engagements uh, between the UW community and Brad and his colleagues. Um, and specifically today, he'll be speaking about the Rohingya crisis. Um, now, our other two panelists, I think, are probably more familiar to many of you, so although their CVs are equally long, um, I'll just be uh, briefly introduce each of them. Uh, Vince Raphael holds the Giovanni and Ann Costigan Endowed Professorship in History here at the UW. He's internationally known for his work across multiple disciplines, including Southeast Asian history, European intellectual history, and anthropology. Vince's writings on comparative colonialism and nationalism, empire, race, and gender are staples in research and teaching in each of these fields. And most recently, he's been writing about the complex interweaving of death, humor, and authoritarianism in the Philippines under President Duterte, and by comparison, in Donald Trump's America. Vince is a graduate of both the Ateneo de Manila and Cornell Universities, and today he's specifically addressing the Duterte regime. And if you know Vince, probably much else besides. <laughs> so, um, Our third speaker, then, is Patrick Christie, who is professor in both the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs and the Jackson School of International Studies here at the UW, um, which I think speaks directly to the important work that he does at the intersection of the social and the ecological. Um, he's led comparative projects in the U.S., the Philippines, Indonesia, and across Latin America, all geared toward understanding and advocating for the human, as well as the technical dimensions of marine conservation. He regularly advises some of the major players in global marine affairs, including the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Bank, USAID, governments, and NGOs. And I think you can see the impact of his work in the fact that he's been um, both a recipient of a Pew Fellowship in marine conservation, and also that he's developed very close working relationships with many local communities that are directly impacted by his work at, by, by marine conservation issues. Patrick's a graduate of the University of Michigan, program in national, uh, natural resources and environment, and today he'll be speaking about the impacts of climate change. So we'll, uh, we've been, they've been each asked to speak for between 10 and 15 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So thank you, and please join me in welcoming our three panelists. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I was asked just to give a brief blurb on Human Rights Watch. Um, so maybe show of hands, how many of you know pretty well what Human Rights Watch does and about the organization? All right, so I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, just to give a little more flesh on the bill, we work in 90 countries. We speak about 80 languages. Uh, we publish dozens of reports every year. Um, we um, are present in a, um, um, in, in UN meetings and foreign ministries, uh, country, national parliaments as much as possible. And basically the idea is that we document human rights abuses and we bring them to public attention and we try to convince people who have power to change their behavior. Um, and, um, and no, we, we don't do humor. Um, so I'm looking forward to <laughs> finding out about humor in, the, in Duterte's war on drugs. Um, we do black humor a lot, that's how we survive. But, um, we don't do public humor, so um, I'm looking forward to learning how to do that because it would be another you know, weapon for us. Um, I, I could talk to you about the Rohingya for hours. Um, I, I bore people all the time with it. Um, can I just another show of hands? How many of you sort of follow the Rohingya, at least at the New York Times level? All right, good. That, that'll, I'll, I'll save us a little bit of time. So where are we right now? We have um, about a million Rohingya in Bangladesh, 250,000 predating the genocide, crimes against humanity, or ethnic cleansing, depending on what you want to call them, because there's a debate about what that was in 2017, um, from previous pogroms against the Rohingya. The Rohingya uh, being uh, the only national 
ethnic and minority group that isn't officially recognized by the Burmese constitution. It was a conscious decision by the Burmese authorities back in 1982, reflecting public sentiment about them that goes back generations. Um, and they are, you know, they are sort of the classic other um, in a country. Uh, wrong color skin, wrong ethnicity, wrong religion, as far as the majority of Buddhist population is concerned. And this is one, one of those cognitive dissonance things that we all have to sort of accept, particularly on the West Coast, where people are really into, uh, many people are into Buddhism, and the idea that Buddhism is peace, and like, well, not always. Um, there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of Buddhist-generated violence. And so here we have, um, in Burma, a Buddhist nationalist movement that has very deep roots in society, um, that um, is manipulated very easily by um, you know, powerful forces, largely the, the military, but not only, um, that have decided that um, their problems would all be solved, we'd only get rid of the Muslims in the country, particularly these Muslims. And so there was a series of attacks on the Rohingya over generations with the claim that they are not of the country. They're, they're interlopers, they're foreigners. Um, sound familiar? We're living through this here and in many other parts of the world right now. Uh, uh, and so uh, after a series of attacks on the Rohingya in August of 2017, August 25th to be exact, the day that Kofi Annan delivered a long anticipated report uh, commissioned by Aung San Suu Kyi to address the problem of the Rohingya and provide um, recommendations about how to integrate the Rohingya into the national community um, and how to end all this, there was an attack by the Burmese military. Uh, purportedly in response to attacks by a small um, militant group called ARSA, which may or may not be infiltrated by the Burmese military, may or may not have um, killed nine Burmese soldiers and police officers at the behest of the Burmese military. This is a big open question in Burma. The evidence is very um, unclear. Um, but they used the attack against some Burmese um, security uh, officials as an excuse to launch a massive attack. And 750,000 people fled the country within months. Um, whole villages were burned down. Our contribution early on to the knowledge of what was going on was through satellite imagery and interviews. The satellite imagery showed very um, well-planned and precise uh, burnings of, of, ar of arson attacks where they um, burned down whole, whole range of villages. And then um, quickly mobilizing people to Bangladesh to interview refugees um, who told us in great detail about attacks on certain villages where people were just massacred. Tula Toli being, uh, Tula Toli massacre being one that um, probably will stand out forever in the way that has in the former of Yugoslavia. Uh, where people were corralled into um, um, an area up against a river, given no place to go, either dive in the river, try to escape, most people don't swim. Um, and those who did try to swim were shot like you know, fish in a river, and those that stayed were, were massacred. A lot of sexual violence. Um, so there's the humanitarian dimension of the problem right now, which is we have a million people in a very poor border neighboring country. Um, the Bangladesh authorities uh, initially tried to push them back. And Bangladesh has presented itself, the government has presented itself as very welcoming. Actually, at first they tried to push them back into the ocean, didn't want to let them in as they have repeatedly over the years. Um, and there's, there's video from 2012 when they actually pushed people out to sea who, whose very creaky boats then, um, then sank. Um, but they were overwhelmed by so many people and it was such a major exodus that it was, national, it was international news and they just couldn't do that because there were, there were too many witnesses. Now the problem is that uh, the international community has fallen short in all of its pledges, which is you know, pretty common. We pledge a billion dollars at a conference, and then we deliver you know, a quarter of it. Basic needs aren't being met. And now there's a conflict between the local population because there is some data showing that the local economy has both been helped at the, at the, um, at the high end. In other words, companies are making a lot of money out of it, but um, local people who are already trying you know, living subsistence lives are actually being hurt because wage levels are being depressed because there's so many new entrants into the labor force. So there's a lot of friction between the two communities. Um, and how that will play out, we don't know. You know our main talking point has been, um, it, it's very sadly coincided with the desires of the Burmese military. Because our, our main demand is for safe and voluntary returns. And the Burmese military and Burmese authorities have no interest in allowing the rain to come back. In fact, the, the whole purpose of the enterprise was to push them out. So they're happy with this outcome, even though they say they want to um, allow people to return. And so we're in a bit of a stalemate because you know uh, 
the Rohingya themselves have made it very clear that they have no intention of going back. Last month there was a huge re repatriation ceremony set up by the Bangladeshis and not a single Rohingya turned up to go back because they don't want to be massacred. And many of them have no place to live. Their land has been taken, their houses are gone, their families are dispersed. So that's one side of the equation. Other side of the equation is what to do about the fact that there were these atrocities. Uh, we, um, our documentation and that of others led to the creation of a, of a um, UN fact-finding mission which did this series of comprehensive reports that are really the gold standard for what the UN can do, um, led by some fantastic people. Um, the way this works behind the scenes is that you know, organizations, organizations like ours propose people to lead these kinds of efforts to make sure that they're led by good, decent, principled, capable people. Um, and in this case, we succeeded. And some very good people have done some really incredible work um, and even expanded the mandate well beyond what I think UN member states at the Human Rights Council thought that they would do. Looking at things like military-based, uh, military-affiliated companies um, and the atrocities that they're responsible for. Um, why is there no justice? Uh, because at this point there has been none. Well, the China, China said from day one they will block any UN Security Council action. This is a classic case where the UN Charter should be invoked. Chapter 7 is specifically about maintenance of international peace and stability, peace and security, sorry, and, and this clearly, uh, as a cross-border uh, huge migration, would normally have led to the invocation of Chapter 7. Under Chapter 7, the UN Security Council can order mandatory actions by states, and one of those actions it can order is a referral to the International Criminal Court for these kinds of atrocities. Uh, and China, China said, and Russia also in the background, as it required, the Chinese said they would also veto. But in fact, the Russians probably wouldn't veto this on their own. They're just making common cause with China. China's even gone so, gone so far as to block almost every attempt to hold a discussion um, at the Security Council, even private discussions. Um, they've tried to sabotage. And they've led efforts at the Human Rights Council to block resolutions. Uh, fortunately, uh, this the sets of atrocities have been so bad, um, so visible, that they haven't been able to stop all conversations with the Security Council, and they have not been able to stop resolutions of the Human Rights Council, which is how the fact-finding mission that I mentioned was created. And one of the interesting twists on this, in terms of global politics, is that the Organization of Islamic Conference, which is made up of uh, majority Muslim countries, has been very outspoken, as has some of its key members, about the Rohingya crisis because of public opinion in their country. So countries that normally block all action at the national level on human rights, like Pakistan, Egypt, Turkey, um, to some extent Malaysia and Indonesia, have supported resolutions um, on, uh, on Myanmar, and Burma, whatever you want to call it, uh, about the Rohingya, and, um, and in their individual capacities have been uh, very outspoken. However, None of them have actually um, followed through on a lot of their rhetoric. Um, Malaysians have been probably the most outspoken and aggressive Muslim-majority country, but even they have um, continued to have decent relations with the Burmese government. Why is that? Well, um, Burma is still a playground for extractive industries and you know, companies and uh, individuals who want to make money out of its natural resources primarily, or maybe out of tourism. So, it's very hard to kind of peel back all these relationships um, in the name of human rights. What has been more disappointing is that um, some Western countries, which have long campaigned on Burma, um, going back decades, against military dictatorship, and I should just remind people that Burma was a, a military dictatorship back in 1962, and it was 50 plus years of military dictatorship broken by the reform process. Uh, which led to the election of an opposition party, the National League for Democracy, um, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, um, to come to civilian power. Um, they have often lost their voices, um, and even when they've um, found their voices, they have often failed to act. And it's been really interesting. Um, why is this? Well, there are modest economic interests in Burma. They aren't very great for any Western country, but there's a lot of economic hope there's a lot of countries that have, have um, particularly since the 2008 financial crisis, been pinning their hopes on creating new trade relationships. And even here we are, 11 years later, a lot of them still see Burma as a possible market, and maybe someday if things work out better, there will be the opportunity for um, significant investments. Um, 
Second, though, is more of a psychological thing. And I, you know, in Cambodia, I found this. A lot of American politicians did not oppose Hun Sen until re relatively recently. The Cambodian prime minister has been now in power for 34 years. Um, because there was war guilt about the U.S. role in Southeast Asia. So we don't want to punish Cambodia, was the line I heard all the time um, in the 90s and the 2000s. And the response was, you should stand up for Cambodian people, not the Cambodian government. Because the Cambodian people is not looking after the interests of the Cambodian. Uh, the Cambodian government is not looking after the interests of the Cambodian people. They're just getting very wealthy and entrenching themselves more deeply into power. The, the, the light went on, a penny dropped, or whatever, you want, whatever metaphor you want. About 10 years ago, nobody's you know, under any illusions about the nature of Hunsen and the regime in Cambodia. With Aung San Suu Kyi, we still have this kind of residue. She's our, she was like the democratic icon. She was the person, you know, Human Rights Watch, we had to take down her. Turned out that a, like three quarters of her offices around the world had that iconic poster of Aung San Suu Kyi, which many of you could have seen in our offices. She was like, she was our heroine. Like, we didn't even agree to have them up at all's offices, just independently. Our offices in Berlin or, you know, Moscow or other places, they had them up because she was, she was the hope. And it turns out she's kind of a creepy person. Um, she shares a lot of the prejudices of uh, the, the, the broader, broader Burmese society. She has not stood up for the Rohingya. She has um, um, put up on, used her website to call reports like ours fake news. Big flashing lights, human rights watch, fake news. Um, she has um, conspired with the military to not even use the word Rohingya. The word Rohingya is essentially banned in Burma, at least in the public discourse. Uh, diplomats have been told not to use it. And for a while, the UN, for a long time, the UN stopped using the word Rohingya. She calls them um, the Muslim minority. That's her euphemism to avoid talk, to avoid um, calling them what they are, calling them what they call themselves. Mitch McConnell, who was the most outspoken American politician, and this much, <laughs> don't follow your chairs, um, for a long time on democracy in Burma, uh, is single-handedly blocking legislation in the U.S. Senate already passed by the House to take action on Burma because he claims he doesn't want to undermine Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, so we have a problem in the West. You know, I lived in London for years, and a lot of British politicians you know, felt a real affinity for Suu Kyi. Her, her husband was British. Um, and, uh, and, and so around a lot of Western foreign ministries and um, heads of governance meetings, they keep saying we can't undermine Aung San Suu Kyi. There's an election next year, and the view is that if they're really clear about Burma, if there's sanctions against Burma, the military will use that to their advantage and say, look, you know, the, the National League for Democracy isn't protecting us. Um, only we can protect you. And that is a, that is a real narrative. That is happening there. And um, there, is, there is some risk. On the other hand, not speaking clearly about genocide uh, when it's so clearly documented. There's no question about what happened. Obviously, not just um, you know uh, soldiers running amok, as the Burmese military likes to say. It was planned, it was executed with real precision. Um, is a setback, not just in Burma, but uh, globally. Um, it, it, it's, it's basically um, turning a blind eye to things that um, we all say we're against. Um, where can it go? Well, there will be an election in Burma next year. Uh, by the way, I say Burma. I don't. Myanmar, Burma. It is, there's a lot of opposition and ethnic groups don't like the term Myanmar simply because Myanmar was, the, the, the name was changed from Burma officially to Myanmar under military rule. And so I'm just, I'm just used to saying Burma, but um, there's, no, don't read it, there's no political statement there. Um, they're, they're going to have elections next year, um, but the elections are a bit farcical still in Burma. This is, this is supposed to be a reform, uh, a reform political system supposed to have a roadmap to democracy. The problem is that the military wrote a constitution where they maintain 25% of the seats in parliament, and they maintain direct control over the military, police, and border guards, which are the, the, the entities in the country that hold guns. So the civilian government um, doesn't have a lot of power um, and can't, can't change military policy. It's impossible. So the elections are for an election for a partial government that is subordinate to the real power in the country, which, which remains the military. And I can tell you just from my interactions with the military, which now um, are a little out of date because they will not have me back in, uh, in the country, at least for now. Some of my colleagues go, but I'm, I'm, I'm personally on grata for, for the moment, at least. The last time I met a senior military official was a couple years ago. He's a deputy minister of defense. And um, when I presented him with our reports on abuses by the military, he said, Mr. Adams, we have no human rights abuses. 
the environment by the military. So that's the state of the discussion. I mean, their official line is that there's, you know, there may be an occasional rogue, rogue soldier. Um, and what they what they're saying about why why are there a million Rohingya in Bangladesh and why did seven hundred fifty thousand leave? Because of propaganda against the state. It actually, it was quite safe. There were just a couple of places where there were problems, and you know we don't really know who set the fires, but it wasn't our soldiers. Um, so uh, we have a completely unreformed military um, on top of a partially democratic elected civilian government. And then finally, I should just add, um, you know. The other consequence of the Rohingya crisis has been a rollback of basic freedoms throughout the country. So when the NLD came in, they said, we are going to solve the political prisoner problem. We've all been political prisoners, and almost two-thirds of their elected members of parliament had spent time in prison as political prisoners. Aung San Suu Kyi famously was a political prisoner and a, um, and a detainee under house arrest for years. Um, we we're going to reform laws that allow the courts to easily, the police to press charges and the courts to convict people very easily. Um, and there are dozens of such laws, and we've written lengthy reports um, identifying all of those, those legal provisions. Um, and we're going to allow the right to protest peacefully. Um, we're going to allow NGOs to form freedom of association we fully respected. All those rights are at risk. Um, and when the first bring of crisis happened on Aung San Suu Kyi's watch, we and others said, careful, because this is such an explosive issue, it could upend the entire democratic process because it will mobilize a lot of dark forces in society, and that's what's happened. And now, we have the NLD um, pressing charges against peaceful protesters and peaceful critics. The NLD itself is asking the courts to imprison people, including for criticism of Aung San Suu Kyi. Just straight up Facebook posts criticizing Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, as well as, and, and then, you know, guess, guess who's uh, taking advantage of that? The military. So now they're having people charged for criticizing the military online. And we are, we are now seeing a huge upsurge in political prisoners in Burma. We're kind of circling back to where we were, except there's no effective opposition to military to de facto military rule, which we still have. Because in the past, it was Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD and all these very brave activists. And I'll leave you with this very disheartening point. Note, a lot of the people that we championed over the years turned out are bigots and have been very loudly anti rohingya themselves. So a lot of the people who were put on a pedestal as um, people that we wanted to um, get out of prison and who said all the right things about democracy and human rights, they have this one little problem with their worldview, um, which is actually a huge problem. And, um, and it has affected their views about a lot of um, civil liberties and fundamental freedoms. So we have a, you know, there's, I'm not going to give you a happy ending. There's no, that's, that's the way for, the way for your jokes. Here, um, no, but you don't understand that jokes are weaponized and are precisely. Uh, I'm, sure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stop, stop, stop. I'm sure that's right. Um, uh, it's, it's a very bleak situation in Burma right now. Uh, and it's hard to see how we get out of this because Aung San Suu Kyi had the moral stat stature if she had used it when the situation first developed. She could have shut this down. And yes, I mean, people who defended her, including some embassies, who are very muting now, you know, you have to understand how difficult the situation is for her. No. She had the status to say, no, it's not going to happen. We're going to stop this. We're going to stop the, the hate speech. We're going to shut down uh, online hate speech. We're going to shut down the kinds of um, stuff that's going on the radio, demonizing Rohingya. We're going to say there were the word Rohingya. Um, and she could have lost some political support. She probably would have. But she would have been fine. She would have come through it. Now, if she does that, she's a very diminished figure. And the military is much stronger than it was before because this has been popular. This is a very sad fact. And they, are, they will take advantage of, of any affinity or any sympathy she shows for the Rohingya. So we're in a pretty invidious situation right now. I guess the hope is that some democratic forces do well in the next election and that there can be an attempt to reset and regroup at that point. But the idea of these Rohingya going back to their villages um, is really hard to imagine. And so we have a million Rohingya living in, uh, as one of my colleagues said, I've been to every refugee camp in Sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world, and there's nothing that compares to this. Um, and how, how to find you know, at least a decent um, life for them is going to probably be the most important challenge that we all face. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, talk about the war on drugs. Well, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. So thank you for the generous introduction, Danny. 
And I'm going to be trying to just very quickly just try to make some connections between the world that I work in, uh, the world of environmentalism and particularly ocean resource management and the world of human rights. It's, it's a, actually it's a growing content uh, study and more importantly activism uh, in the world. It's no longer just about saving the ocean and saving the cool critters that live at the bottom of the ocean. It's a very different world that we're increasingly maybe it's a little bit more optimistic because the discourse is opening up in really interesting ways. Um, so, you know, being a faculty member in the Jackson School, I'm constantly asked to make the question, why would you study the oceans? How is this even relevant to the Jackson School of International Studies? And I think there's probably very few of us who work in ocean issues. But let's just realize one thing. We live on a blue planet, right? Um, humanity colonized this planet by walking along shorelines. That's how they left Africa, because it was where resources were abundant and where they didn't have to cross mountain ranges. Uh, it's also how North America was colonized uh, by humanity. Uh, oceans are very important economically because they provide opportunities for commerce. Uh, so many countries will go to the mat to have access to the oceans. Humanity wants to be on the oceans. Think of all the future mega cities of the planet, they're almost all along coastlines because of access to resources, because access to trade, etc. Uh, and so, uh, and they're also interestingly, uh, well, they're also areas of intense political disputes right now. And I work a lot in the Philippines. Uh, you know, think about the Spratly Islands and the South China Sea and the intense. Uh, conflict around who controls those islands that are well within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, and yet, of course, China wants to control them because then they will control the most important trade route on the planet, which is all the trade leaving Asia, coming to the United States market, goes through that very narrow area, and if they can control both sides of it, uh, they have a huge influence uh, in what happens globally. Uh, of course, as a person who studies, uh, so I'm sort of half ecologist and half sociologist, I study the culture of conservation. I study the epistemic community that su surrounds conservation, the proponents of it, the detractors of it, the donors behind it, etc. If you're interested in the kind of stuff that I'm talking about, I really encourage you to read this book by um, Philip Steinberg. Uh, it's, a, it's a really brilliant uh, analysis about the social construction of the ocean. It looks going even back to the papal bulls where half the planet was given to the Spaniards and the Portuguese and coming through a mercantilism and sort of the militant sort of militarization of the oceanscape. As geographer, you know, he's interested in sea space. Um, but most interestingly, he brings it into the sort of current present moment by looking at people like Sylvia Earle and her ideas about, you know, Will we be able to enclose the high seas? You have to also realize oceans are really interesting because a big part of the oceans are outside national jurisdictions. So what do you do with these massive areas that increasingly under the so-called rubric of the blue economy? This is the rhetoric now, the blue economy. There's now talk of privatizing, effectively privatizing the oceans for oil, gas, nickel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are entering in a really weird space right now and increasingly uh, discussion. Of course, it's also kind of fun because Philip Steinberg takes people like iconic people like Sylvia Earle to task by saying, you know, your ideas about sort of saving the blue planet for uh, pretty animals is sort of completely naive because effectively the, the Pentagon will never allow us to sort of enclose the high seas for environmentalist sort of goals. And so he kind of takes the ocean conservation community to task with this sort of naive assumptions. It's also, I work a lot in coral reef systems, not only because they're really fun to work on. I work, I mostly I study trash coral reefs. So if you think I do this for sort of junkets, realities, I'm mostly diving in very depressing, uh, you know, Manila Bay, for example, mm -hmm. doing fish surveys. Um, but in any case, coral reefs are really important. Just think about this, you know, the ecosystem services of coral reefs is not unlike that of the U.S. economy. I mean, these systems, we, we have gone forward as a humanity and humankind just sort of taking for granted clean air, air, or water, the protections that coral reefs offer from typhoons and, and, and making sure areas don't. And, but of course, other issues, and I'll talk about food security in a little bit. Of course, uh, important jobs come from uh, fisheries globally. Uh, and, and I think this is maybe one, this is an interesting slide. This, we live in a city where 
front page above the fold can be about the oceans. I mean, what a weird place Seattle is. But this is an article about food security. And one of the things you have to recognize is that fish are frequently the most important sources of protein around the planet. Those ones that are in dark red are where people get over more than 30% of their animal protein from fish. The ones in Africa are mostly freshwater fishers. We tend to discount the importance of these. But look at, obviously, Southeast Asia. I've lived a lot as a Peace Corps volunteer as well as like just spending tons of time in fishing communities where it's not uncommon for people to get 50% of the animal protein from the ocean. And of course, I never use a sort of Malthusian framing of these issues, but the reality is that in the Philippines you have 110 million people getting, you know, their 50% of the animal protein in the Philippines is the size of Arizona. I mean, it's a lot of fish coming out of the ocean. People are eating Nemo. They actually make soup out of damsel fish because that's what's left in the ocean. Uh, it's also not so horrible, though. The Philippines also has a very interesting Philippine-led community-based conservation movement that my analysis is that it emerged out of sort of approaches that were used in community organizing uh, that had been used to displace Marcos. And then those people who came out of um, various universities then decided what was the next big challenge? And it was about reasserting control and tenure, and marine tenure that had been lost to the Spaniards and to the Americans over, over centuries. Um, so, you guys all know this, right? We just had the climate strike. Uh, I hope you were out there. Uh, but <laughs> let's not, I mean, I, I'm not gonna get in an argument about what, like, what catastrophe, like, you know, makes the claim to the greatest catastrophe, but I have a 16 year old daughter, right? Her life is going to be defined by climate change. There's not an aspect of the economy, of university life, of society life that within 20 or 30 years will not be defined about what's what's happening. Miami is going underwater. Insurance companies will no longer be able to insure the East Coast of the United States. I mean, this stuff is going to get pretty crazy pretty fast. And we live in this world in which people are saying, oh, well, it's maybe your science, but not my science. I mean, uh, read The Guardian. It's a really good analysis about what happened on science. So, you know, and it's also relevant to the kind of work that we do around uh, demo uh, demography and sort of uh, migrations. I mean, look what's going on right now. I don't care how big the wall is on the southern border here. You know, people are being displaced. There's indications now that e agricultural systems in Central America are failing. Traditional knowledge systems around you know, fishery or uh, farming is completely failing. And so when those people get really hungry, they're coming here. And uh, there's going to be mass movements throughout the world, Africa, et cetera, Asia, et cetera. And, and there's going to be violence associated with that. If you don't know already, recently uh, the UN came out with the recent IPCC report that basically suggests we have a window of just a little over a decade to make massive changes in our economy, economy and how we generate electricity. Otherwise, we'll have, we help, we'll have baked in a two centigrade or higher climate change scenario in your lifetimes, which means like, crazy shit's about to go down. And I am not the kind of person who's like this still big kind of person. I'm always the guy who's like, yeah, and people are doing really cool stuff. And so, um, but we have a very narrow window here, guys. And it's all about these. This is monitoring of CO2 data from Mauna Loa Observatory. This is the Keeling curve. And basically you see that over the time, the CO2, this guy said, you know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It works like a, a blanket. And it's not just CO2, it could be methane, released by frack gas facilities, for example. And what's, you know, here's a cool thing. Go to this thing, you can freak yourself out every day. You can go look at the parts per million of the atmosphere on a daily basis. This is NOAA data. This is measured to Mauna Loa as well. So we're well over 400 parts per million. 350.org, the organization, the climate change group, was trying to keep us below 350. And we are well shot. And, uh, of course, this is what really matters, is that if you look at the temperature of the planet and CO2 concentrations, basically those two lines are almost 100% correlated. So as CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere go up, the temperature is going up. It is physics. It is not debatable. <laughs> um, 
So in the Philippines, uh, I was just looking recently about like just sort of what's the discourse around there. The Philippine government, there's been some denial of scientists in the Philippines, well-known ones, but in general, the Philippine country, the government is sort of recognizing that climate change is going to be a very big issue for the Philippine government. Some would suggest it's one of the most climate change hazard exposed country on the planet. Typhoons, it's right in the middle of the typhoon belt. Massive, and as you can see here, this one, um, massive storms now have been continually bashing into the country. Uh, the infrastructure is just not up to it. Of course, the poorest of the poor live out over the ocean are the most uh, affected. And I wanted to just, can we, do we have this on a separate thing? I just wanted to play just an example of, you know, uh, sort of remarks by an important uh, leader uh, in uh, uh, the Philippines. And just listen to the discourse of the narrative here. Uh, this gentleman and how he's framing this as a human rights issue. My country is being tested by this hailstorm called Super Typhoon Haiyan. We remain uncertain as to the full extent of the damage and devastation as information trickles in agonizingly slow manner because power lines and communication lines have been cut off and may take a while before they are restored. The initial assessment showed that Haiyan left a wake of massive destruction that is unprecedented, unthinkable, and horrific. And the devastation is staggering. I struggle to find words even for the images that we see on the news coverage. And I struggle to find words to describe how I feel about the losses up to this hour, I agonize, waiting for word to the fate of my very own relatives. What gives me renewed strength and great relief is that my own brother has communicated to us and he had survived the, the onslaught. I speak for my delegation, but I, I speak, speak for the countless people who will no longer be able to speak for themselves after perishing from the storm, I speak also for those who have been orphaned by the storm. I speak for those of the people now raising its time to save survivors and alleviate the suffering of the people affected. We can take drastic action now to ensure that we prevent a future where super typhoons become a way of life. Can we ever attain the ultimate objective of the convention, which is to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system? By failing to meet the objective of the convention, me, we may have ratified our own doom. We have to confront the issue of loss and damage. Loss and damage is a reality today across the world. We cannot solve climate change when we seek to spew more emissions. In solidarity with my countrymen who are struggling to find food back home, and with my brother who has not had food for the last three days, with all due respect, Mr. President, and I mean no disrespect for your kind hospitality. I will now commence a voluntary fasting for the climate. This means I will voluntarily refrain from eating food during this COP until a meaningful outcome is in sight, until concrete pledges have been made to ensure mobilization of resources for the Green Climate Fund. We cannot afford a fourth COP with an empty GCF until the promise of the operationalization of a loss and damage mechanism has been fulfilled, until there is assurance on finance for adaptation. Okay, and the sake of time, I just wanted to point out, I mean, one of the things I also want to point out, guys, is that food um, security issues, so coral reefs, coral reefs bleach, they lose their photosynthetic uh, 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 symbiont, uh, zoosynthelli, they bleach, they turn white, they die. Young people in this room will probably witness the disappearance of coral reefs as a functional ecosystem on the planet. Which also means food security to be in displaced. There's also the issue of species that have home ranges in the tropics are now already migrating away from the equator. There's going to be a lot of changes in terms of food security in these countries. And I'm almost done here. Um, so as you can see, there's frustration. And as we know right now with climate change, the formal negotiations are not going particularly well. 
Uh, there's losing inc increasing loss of faith in the international. I'm not saying that people should walk away from the Paris Accord. Some suggest that it's actually good that the Trump administration is no longer part of the Paris Accord because the role of the United States frequently in those negotiations, even in the Obama administration early fourth year, was to disrupt climate change negotiations. So some people are saying, you know what? Good riddance. Get rid of the U.S. Civil society should be leading the way. And that's where a lot of my research now is focusing on what's the response. There's very interesting work and uh, in, in works around learning networks, kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning networks emerging in this regarding climate change. I do work with this group called Locally Managed Marine Area Network, which is really about empowering resilient communities. Uh, but of course, you can also find a very active 350.org Philippine chapter, and there's a lot of movements now in the climate strikes, etc. So. You know, if you were to believe Naomi Klein's This Changes Every Book, every, Everything kind of analysis is that while this is a massive crisis, it's maybe also uh, going to lead us into this area where we'll question the notion of unfettered capitalism and the implications of that for society. Because I think we are now beginning to look into the kind of abyss and realizing that maybe the poorest of the poor will suffer the most, but the whole society is going to really uh, suffer the consequences. So, those are my remarks. Uh, President Duterte's signature uh, policy, and it's, it, he's basically given the police carte blanche to uh, pursue, prosecute, and kill uh, suspected uh, drug dealers uh, who are also drug users. Uh, they, in fact, they have, they have a, a particular word to indicate the two users and dealers, because the assumption is that if you're a user, you're dealing, uh, which is drunk personalities, right? So he just wants to get rid of all these drunk personalities, uh, which he sees as a scourge on, uh, especially poor communities. Uh, he sees them, and when he when he says drugs, the particular drug that he's uh, uh, particularly against is, is meth. So he, he, he said very, very clearly, he doesn't care about weed, doesn't care about cocaine, you know, these are all organic. Besides, only the rich people use them, right? He's only concerned with meth because this is the most widespread drug used by, by poor people. So many people have also interpreted this as a war on the poor, or at least certain segments of the poor. And his whole argument is that uh, uh, by doing this, I'm keeping the community safe. By getting rid of these drug personalities, I'm actually helping people uh, rather than harming them. Uh, and his, his, uh, one of his famous taglines, which I'm sure Brian remembers, was, uh, I did, he didn't care about human rights, he cares about human lives. Right? So the official discourse is a systematic disconnection between human rights and human lives, as if human rights was this alien imposition that gets in the way of human lives. Because the argument, and this comes from the police as well, is that human rights only benefit the criminals. It only ensures that they go back to uh, the communities that continue to commit crimes, right? Uh, whereas people just want to get rid of them. And, what's, and, and, and so this is the second thing I mentioned. First of all, the official discourse. But I'm also very interested in the popular reception of this official discourse, which is by going through uh, both anecdotal evidence as well as uh, by polling, shows that in fact uh, this is a very popular notion, this, this idea of getting rid of drug personalities uh, is in fact a very popular notion uh, that many, many people, in, especially in the poor community, seem to think is a, it's not such a bad idea. You know, very common to hear people say, it used to be I couldn't go home at night without having to fear these drug addicts uh, pulling a knife on me and mugging me. Now I can go home at 10.30, I don't have to worry, everything is cool. Right? And, and, and this is part of the mystification of the drug war. The drug war wouldn't be so sustained and image just as claimed Officially, it's claimed of over 6,000 lives, unofficially, uh, by the counts of certain organizations like Human Rights Watch. Uh, you know, it's almost up to 30,000 unaccounted deaths. So, I mean, it's it, it massive by, by, any, by any measure. So part of what I'm trying to figure out is why, why is there this popular acceptance, right? I guess this would be the flip side of the Uyunga situation, which is why, why is there so much bigotry? Right. In this case, why is there so much popular acceptance of this logic? Uh, when in fact it's a very logic, the logic of the drug war is being used against the very people uh, who accept it. Right? Why do people accept the very logic that endanger their lives? Why do they 
consent to be governed by, you know, what I've been calling a biopolitics of fear, right? Uh, instead of rising up against it. And there are many, many reasons for that. But before I get into that, maybe what I should do is show the film. It's, I have an a, a eight and a half minute video that sort of gives you a rough overview of the drug war. And the film itself is very interesting because it brings up, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a documentary that's been, you know, uh, internationally recognized. So it's very interesting because I think it's typical of the kind of critical uh, counterpoint to the drug war that you see among journalists, among human rights advocates, uh, and especially among photographers and artists. This is a very kind of typical response, which is a response that is based primarily, uh, or, or a response that I would characterize as a kind of moral critique. The problem is how do you graduate from a moral critique into a political critique? And that transformation from the moral to the political is, I think, one of the big question marks. Uh, that's not just in the case of the drug war in the Philippines, but I think you could probably see that in lots of other contexts uh, in the world. So uh, let's let's watch the film. Now, if, if the criminals there are killed by the thousands, that's not my problem. If it involves human rights, I don't give a shit. Hitler massacred three million Jews. Now there is three million, there's a three million drug addict. There are. I'd be happy to slaughter him. Ito sila lahat. Puro mga kabataan pa na walang kumuha sa mundo. Yung mga target nila, hindi naman na, ano, na, na target na nakatakas. Paano naman po yung mga walang muang? Bawang ay sa ano! Ano lang kapatid ko? Ang kakapalang mga mukha nyo! Ano nyo? Patay nyo yung kapatid ko! Ang sila pahirapan! Guys, gani. Ito lang pong nakaraan po, ha, November 26, birthday niya. Ito pong anak ko. Ito pang ito, kahit naman ho sino, kahit po kayo sa malagay ho kasi sa amin, masakit po kayo mawala ng anak. Ako, dinala nyo na lang dito! Bigla kayong lumiko! Ang ginawa nyo kaming tanga! Hoy, saan mo dada rin yan?
my victims, I would like to be all criminals to finish the problem and save the next generation. I, I, I can be nasty. I mean, I can be a bad boy. And if I have to kill you, I will kill you, personally. Matay man ang buong pamilya ko, hindi po sir anak ko. Walang baril ang anak ko. Please! Tell to the whole world! Help us! Please! Help me! <laughs> It's not a dog, my son! It's not a dog or a pig to be like them!
this is, I mean, in some ways, it's a very well done, but it's very typical of the kind of uh, kind of criticisms of, of, of the drug war. Uh, I myself have been looking at the photographs that are in the documentaries, but you get the same kind of. It's very noirish. It's very dark. Uh, it, it, as I said, it, 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 it leads to a sort of assumption that this is this is evil. This is morally wrong. Uh, but but uh, in terms of like, what do you do now? There's very little of that. Um, uh, obviously, there are there are human rights. Uh, there's a commission on human human rights. I'm sorry, commission on human rights that has been trying to uh, sort of record all these killings. There have been other organizations uh, in the universities that have been meticulously documenting uh, the conditions under which people were killed, uh, who they were, uh, the police uh, uh, command that was responsible uh, for the killings of these people, so on and so forth. At the moment, there is uh, uh, now the, the ICC has been in the process of uh, opening up investigations of Duterte, much to Duterte's uh, sort of, you know, uh, it, it, there's been a lot of backlash against the ICC as a result of this. Uh, the United Nations Human Rights Organization uh, has uh, voted to open uh, uh, an investigation of, of uh, human rights violations as well. Uh, this was a petition that was put together by Iceland and was voted on by the majority of the uh, UN uh, HRC, uh, United Nations uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Commission, uh, and in response, the Turkey has basically said, uh, you know, we're not going to allow them to come here, uh, we're not going to cooperate, and he has issued uh, instructions to uh, uh, diplomats all over the Philippines uh, to stop going to the receptions and basically stop socializing and hanging out with with uh, all the countries that voted for this human rights investigation. Uh, he's, he, uh, they, they, they refused aid from the European Union, uh, which had been you know, sort of pursuing these human rights. So, so there's a lot of pushback from the government. And the reason is because you know it's all about sovereignty. This is our sovereign right. We can do what we want. We can't have other countries telling us what to do. It's the same kind of justification, for example, that China might use uh, to uh, sort of tell you know, the world, to, uh, we're going to treat the, the rigorous the way we want to do, uh, and, and we have no business telling us how to run our affairs, uh, so on and so forth. So, so, in a very sort of weird kind of way, uh, that distinction between human, li human rights and human lives uh, is, 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 is very much a sort of uh, working in these cases where human lives is understood to be a kind of human right. Right? In other words, you, know, you have this universalized notion of human rights, which assumes that each and every human being is entitled to dignity. And by dignity, this means that each and every human being should be treated as an end in themselves and not an instrument to somebody else's end. Right? That we, all, we, are, we should all be treated uh, equally as human beings. It's the sort of thing that you might see enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, for example. Um, but uh, the problem, of course, is uh, in the case of the Philippines, in the case of China, in the case of Burma and other places, the idea of human lives uh, will, will vary. In other words, what counts as human, uh, they, they'll have their own sort of uh, notion of like, who counts as human, right? Uh, will have their own notion. In other words, this universal discourse of human dignity that is at the foundational basis of human rights uh, is constantly contested, and constantly questioned, right? What, what counts as a dignified existence? If you're a poor person uh, who doesn't have a job, who starves half of the time, uh, who leads a very precarious life, obviously uh, you have no human dignity, right? Uh, and then the question of dignity, of course, comes up, this idea of dignity of, of human beings as an end in themselves and not an instrument for somebody else's hand, that comes up against the, the very you know, sheer fact of global capitalism. Capitalism is dedicated to reducing human beings into instruments for profit. How can we say, right, how can we say that we'll live in a world uh, where human dignity is respected when, you know, we're all subjected and subordinated to the larger powers, corporations, military, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are essentially inhuman, or at least larger than and which we look at individuals as means to an end, right? So the very uh, foundation of human rights comes into a real crisis 
in that crisis becomes very explicit when you try to hold governments like the terrorists uh, accountable. Right? Uh, so that's one thing. The last thing I want to say, and then maybe we can open this up, which was the, the thing I was getting back to, is why, why is he so popular? Why is the government so popular? Why do people accept that rationale that what he's doing is actually providing for people's security when, when the very people who he's supposed to be securing are in fact being targeted uh, by his, by his, uh, by his policies? You know, it's hard to tell. I mean, this uh, regime's only three years old. And it's, it's still very much in process. But from what I can gather, both from uh, research of, of a whole bunch of anthropologists who've been working on the ground, as well as from reading the newspapers and from anecdotal uh, set of accounts, I, I think what it is is Duterte has put in place an infrastructure, and, and, and the police have been very central in, in, in materializing and, and operationalizing, operationalizing this infrastructure. It's put in place an infrastructure uh, that guarantees that people uh, fear the authorities, and fear affects the very ways in which they lead their lives, rather than protest, rather than organize. Organize, people simply accept uh, what the police tell them to do, uh, what, what the Turkey tells them to do. Um, and so the hope is that things don't get any worse. Right, that they can't get any worse. That, that if they if they protest, if they do something, that things will in fact get worse. So it's better to sort of stay in that kind of holding pattern. The other thing too, and this is actually where the question about humor comes in, is that many people, especially poor people, still identify with the target. They still see him as he's one of us. You know, he tells jokes like the kind of jokes you might tell one another. Uh, he uh, engages in all of these sort of you know bad boy behavior the way we would. Right. In other words, he's not polite. He doesn't uh, sort of uh, kowtow to all these bourgeois niceties. Right? Uh, he knows us. He shares our culture. Right? Uh, in the case of that, that's in the case of lower class people. In the case of middle class to upper class people, an enormous amount of support also comes from wealthy people and from middle class people. They see the Turk as basically allowing them to engage in the sort of uh, capitalist enterprises and making money and so forth uh, that they're used to. Uh, one, the other signature policy that he has is this thing called build, 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 which is this concerted attempt at directing government spending, much of which comes from loans from China, right? government spending towards building massive infrastructure developments, because the Philippines is very much behind the infrastructure, roads, bridges, transportation, airports. And you know what happens when you have infrastructure development? Certain people tend to make shitloads of money, shitloads of money, right? Uh, there's very little accountability. Uh, there's no bid, no, no bid projects, people come in. A lot of nepotism, right? Uh, so for example, um, the, uh, Secretary of, of, uh, the Secretary of the Department of Public Works, which oversees these construction sites, he is the eldest son of uh, one of the senators who's head of the Agricultural Committee, who in turn is married to one of the richest men in the Philippines, who is in charge of the largest real estate corporation in the country. Right. So you can imagine the kind of corruptions that these open up. You, know, you build roads that make sure they go through the suburban developments that he's doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So given the fact that there are certain profits to be made from continuing to support the Turkey, you can see why certain elements of the middle class and upper class uh, is still, uh, still supported. Uh, and finally, opposition. What about the opposition? Uh, there's, there's, there is certainly opposition, but it's opposition, and, and again, Brian knows this, and, 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 and Patrick knows this. It's a kind of opposition that's very dispersed at the moment. Uh, they, 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 they can't seem to uh, get their act together in terms of having a concerted counter narrative right, to what the Turkey is doing. Um, the church, uh, which traditionally has led uh, a kind of political opposition under Marcos, for example, uh, has been, uh, you know, a lot less effective. Uh, and there are all kinds of complicated reasons for this, uh, but they haven't been as effective. And the Turkey has gone out of its way to delegitimize and deauthorize the Catholic Church. Uh, one of the stories he likes to tell, and again, this is part of the way he's weaponized humor. He likes to tell the story of having been. Uh, molested by an American Jesuit when he was 13 years old, right? So that's that's a twofer, because not only is it against the church, it's also against the Americans, right? And because the Americans, have sort of, at least till Trump, have been sort of pushing for human rights, and that's his way of sort of neutralizing the Americans. Um, so, so all of these different, and, and they, they tried to defund the Commission on Human Rights, 
um, he's tried to uh, imprison journalists for reporting negatively on him, and so on and so forth. So all of this has made it very, very difficult to sort of launch a sustained united opposition against Duterte. So I'll stop there because we're out of time and open it up for questions. Great, thanks. So we do have uh, some time for questions, and I would imagine after this presentation, there's probably a lot of them. Um, I won't turn the video camera on any of the questioners, but I'm going to keep it running just so we can record the questions as well. Um, so feel free to ask. Is there a question for Vince? Yeah. Um, have the, these policies worked in the way that Duterte has wanted them to? Is, are there... Of course not. No? No, of course not. What's happened is that over the, over the last few months, the killings have moved. They used to be concentrated in Metro Manila, and now they've moved to the provinces. And you can actually map it. The killings increase depending on who the police uh, chief is. Because mm. some police chiefs are really a lot more murderous than others. Right? That's number one. Number two, I should add that the killings continue because they're also they're, they also bring with them financial incentives. Police uh, are routinely, each policeman is routinely given a certain amount of money um, for bringing in a certain number of kills. If they arrest the person, they don't get any money. Um, but if they kill, then you know, they, get, they get some money. And then whatever drugs they confiscate is usually distributed and sold on their own. So it, it's a very, the, the corruption is very systematic. Right? Um, so there's really no incentive uh, to to uh, 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 kill. In the meantime, the big drug lords are running around, um, and they are using, especially the Bureau of Customs, which is the single most corrupt agency in the Philippines, uh, to bring in lots and lots of meth, right? And the meth usually comes from China, and it usually probably comes. Speculation probably comes from the from the uh, Chinese triads, right? Um, lots of the meth labs are actually on ships that are offshore. They cook the meth, and then they bring it in through these smaller boats. I mean, this is, you know, who needs breaking bad? I mean, you've got this. It's an incredible scene. So they cook the meth offshore. They bring it through these small boats. And because the Philippines is an archipelago, there are lots of places where you can dock. And then they load them up into these vans. And then the vans, uh, at least in one story, the vans drive them into uh, the basement of casinos. Because one of the booming industries in the Philippines right now is the gaming industry. So lots of these really fancy casinos. So they drop them into the casinos, and then they park right beside a van that has the money, and they just simply exchange the keys. And of course, the money is then uh, laundered into that. That's why you need casinos, because casinos are the best place to launder money, as if you didn't know. So, um, yeah, so, so there's lots of money to be made. So the irony is the drug war actually works in tandem with the drug, drug trade, right? The, the more intense the drug war is, the further the drug trade grows. And one of the Turkish sons, his eldest son, is rumored to be uh, an integral part of this drug, drug trade industry. So. Colin? Hi, my name is Colin Morris. I'm actually just visiting uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, talk a little bit about civil society. Um, and civil society, particularly in the Philippines, is, is quite vibrant. Um, and with the focus of the Duterte administration, there's a lot of look at law enforcement, but not justice reform. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about that dynamic with civil society and efforts to push towards, like improving the justice system, where there's commonly told yeah. about you know cases taking 20, 30 years yeah. to be processed? Um, that's, that, that's a great question. Is, you know, again, as, as both Patrick and Grant knows, it's very difficult to uh, pursue human rights unless you have a, a, a working justice system. And the justice system in the Philippines, at least as we know it today, is very, very terribly, terribly broken. Uh, prisons are overcrowded. Uh, in fact, uh, the biggest prison, the national prison, is uh, uh, one of the biggest sources for the drug trade. Uh, the drug lords who are in the prison are uh, usually given lots of privileges. They have their own apartments. They even have apartments for conjugal visits and apartments for their mistresses. They're allowed to keep weapons. They have tons of money. They have cell phones. So basically, they run their empire from the prison. Prison guards are all part of it, and so forth. So it's, you know, in a situation like that, it's very difficult. And then, and then the, the poor schmucks who get into prison, I mean, they, 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 they're, they're herded into these very cramped spaces in the city prisons where you actually have to take turns lying on the floor because it's so crowded. Right? You have to negotiate, like, okay, how many hours can I stand? How many hours can I lie on the floor? 
and, and if you see them, they look like somebody once told me the pictures of the, the, the prisoners all sort of, sort of cramped up. They said they look like slave ships, you know, uh, what the interior of slave ships would look like. So, uh, it, 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 and we can talk about judges in, in the situation with, with, with the judicial system, if you want. I mean, the fact that they get very little paid, uh, that they're prone to being uh, bribed, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and right now, the Supreme Court, which is one of the last legitimate institutions, is under a lot of criticism because they've become very politicized. The latest thing that they've done is they've actually allowed uh, Bong Bong Marcos, the son of a former dictator who ran for vice president and who's suing because he lost the last election, he's suing for a recount. They've actually allowed this case to prosper. So many people feel like, oh, okay, they, they've been run off by the Marcos. So there's very little, very little legitimacy. Uh, where, where, the, where the justice system is concerned. And if you don't have a legitimate justice system, how are you going to have human rights? Brian, you, could I ask? Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to just say, I mean, one of the things in the world that I live in that's interesting is that there's a lot of, um, as you said, vibrancy in the civil society. There's a lot of momentum in organizing responses to climate change. Uh, as I said, uh, reasserting tenure over spaces that have been lost for centuries, for example. So, but in a sense, my take, and this is based on it's something your question makes me think a little bit more about, is that in the realm of kind of um, sustainable resource management, organizing to protect climate, uh, respond to climate change, these kind of spaces that don't question the, right, uh, the uh, hegemony of sort of power and kind of uh, call people out in the, in the Philippine context. There's a lot of uh, trade, illegal fishing trade, for example, all the live food fish trade that you see, those live fish that you go to Chinese restaurants in throughout Asia, almost all of those are caught with sodium cyanide. Same thing with aquarium fish, almost all of the live uh, aquarium fish trade, most of that comes from the Philippines, most of that's caught with child labor, uh, sodium cyanide is used, children are bent, meaning they're paralyzed, there's a lot of health issues around it. Um, when you begin to challenge syndicates around this kind of trade, or you, in this case, it's actually linked to sort of mafia uh, behavior and is linked to the drug trade, for example, there's frequently a linkage between illegal fishing and drug trafficking because yes. out on the high seas it's the same thing in South Africa many places. But in any case, um, so there's a space for civil society to be mobilized as long as it doesn't challenge the interests, financial interests of certain groups of society. And then once you do, uh, a very good friend of mine's wife, who was an environmental lawyer, she was summarily executed in front of her children with a guy from a motorcycle just came in. Just, and this, this is, so to get, in fact, I was contacted by a public prosecutor in the U.S. who was trying to use the Lacey Act to go after aquarium fish uh, exporters who are violating their own laws and exporting those fish to the United States. The Lacey Act is what busted Al Capone, mm -hmm. you know, cross-border trade. Mm -hmm. And basically I contacted my friends who are environmental lawyers in the Philippines because they have to build the case on that side. And all my friends, especially after this woman was summarily executed, they were like, thanks yeah. but no thanks. Yeah. We just, it's just yeah. so dangerous. Yeah. It, it really is government, <laughs> government, go, yeah, it really is government by fear. Brent, Brent, could I ask you to weigh in on, on this question as well? Um, if not necessarily in the Philippines, but... Well, one think. of the ironies about the Philippines uh, losing uh, or, or Duterte turning down economic aid from the Philippines is that one of their signature projects was reform of the justice system. Yeah. So Duterte had a reason, you know, an ulterior motive for turning that aid down. But, yeah. um, he turned down a lot of other aid that would have actually helped people with their yeah. livelihoods and um, economic circumstances. I mean, you know, Trump is playing the same game, right? This, this is now, it's always been the playbook of autocrats, populists, and charlatans, and, you know, it's being played out in various places, and uh, governed by fear, pit people against each other, tell people that I, I'm the only person who can solve your problems. They're all against you, I'm with you, even though Trump clearly is plutocrat. Um, Duterte, by the way, was born wealthy. He's had a privileged life his whole life. Um, he has admitted, by the way, using drugs, and he's claimed at one point having killed somebody when he's younger. He then sort of dances around and says, well, maybe I've misinterpreted my English isn't so good. Or in one case, my Tagalog, my, my Tagalog isn't so good, because he said, well, he's in Tagalog. Um, and 
you know, there's very complicated reasons why these things happen, but they're also sometimes inexplicable. Like, the previous government in the Philippines was led by um, an Aquino, Cory Aquino's son, and I think that a fair assessment of his period in power is that things went generally okay. Like, there were a lot of structural problems, you didn't really solve them, but the economy was doing better, they were chipping away at corruption, institutions were performing a little bit better. Um, there wasn't a national crisis, nor was there when Obama left. You know, Trump made people believe that there was a national crisis and mobilized a lot of voters in that way. Um, and quite what the, you know, we, we have not figured out what it is about the social conditions in various countries that allow, for instance, the Pakistani government is doing the same thing right now. We have a takeover of the Pakistani civilian a governance system by the military through the back door by installing their own guy, Imran Khan's former cricketer, playboy, um, who claims to be like the most pious Muslim in the world. He used to be a playboy cricketer married to a British woman and throwing big fancy parties that put him on the front page of Hello and every other you know, National Enquirer type magazine. Yet in Pakistan, people are buying it. And we're all trying to figure out like what is what is going on underneath it in, this, in certain countries that allows this mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. dishonesty and um, these kinds of, you know, the big lie, basically, which is being sold in so many countries, to flourish? Um, the one thing that you can find, <coughs> one, one through line, which I don't think is a sufficient explanation, is, um, is identifying the, you know, the, the worst fears of the largest number of people mm -hmm. playing on them. And the drug war is a good example. The Philippines, by the way, was around had, had around the average drug problem globally of, of other countries in the world. Duterte made people in the Philippines believe it had the worst drug problem in the world. The evidence just isn't there, and you know, people, well-intentioned um, experts, said, "No, it's not true," but it, but it wasn't hurt. Um, and so we are seeing this in lots of places. To give the biggest, you know, the two biggest, the two biggest countries in the world, China and India, are going through this right now themselves. Right. There's this extreme, in Brazil. in Brazil, extreme nationalism being played upon by political leaders who are doing it, you know, for their own ends. Narendra Modi is has sold lots of big lies to the Indians about um, about the situation of the country and how he's going to solve it. And Xi Jinping is you know, Chinese nationalism at its all-time high, yeah. um, at a time when people should be celebrating how how far they've come. He's made them fear about how far they can fall. Yeah, um, I was wondering, in Burma, uh, has the Burmese press played any role in popularizing the actions of the military against the Republic? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, like the members of the NLD, who we thought were promoters of human rights, the Burmese uh, Journalist community has been basically split in the same way. There are some extremely brave Burmese journalists, um, including these two Reuters journalists. Right. Some of you may know about the case where they investigated a mass grave and then were arrested for the investigation um, on fake official secrets claims. Um, and then there are lots of journalists who really shocked us. People I know, um, people we've defended, who have taken the most virulent anti. Ringy position. And there's some who tried to straddle it. The Irrawaddy, which is a really well known publication, English language publication, has um, has brothers leading it and they've behaved in different ways. Um, and, um, well, not brothers leading it, but they used to have brothers leading it. But the brothers are, you know, one of them has remained largely principled, one of them has basically become an apologist. Um, A lot of journalists are going back to prison. There are a lot of criminal cases being filed against journalists in Burma. We, we have seen the union of journalists. There's a, there are various journalist unions, but the biggest one has been quite vocal about criminal cases against journalists. But they haven't been great defenders of freedom of expression at the same time. Um, and a lot of journalists have just basically taken the money. So one, one of the things that's happened is that the military is very, they, they, they do what you would expect them to do. They, identified critical journalists and bought many of them off. And so a lot of them are just either um, silent, have chosen new professions, or are writing for military outlets because they make more money. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, there's still a, 
um, cohort of good journalists in them, you can still build on it. It's not over with, with independent professional journalism in Burma, but it's not anything like what we would have hoped for at this point. It's interesting because that combination of money, violence, and fear has turned authoritarian governing into a racket. Very much a racket. And uh, the mafia would probably be a better way, a better model for trying to understand how they operate. Yeah. Certainly in this country. In the mafia analogy would be like, you know, it's basically protection money. You know? Protection money. That's what you have to pay in your words as a journalist in a lot of places. Uh, write the stories you need to write for. It's a little bit counterintuitive um, that right after the change of constitution in Myanmar and the rise of the NLD back in power, and with all the economic growth and the reopening of the country that goes with it during the first few years, I'm not thinking about what happened in yeah. the last two years, when the country falls into this, this crisis like within three years. So it's, I feel, I personally feel that it's missing a a cause, or at least a fundamental root. You mentioned, you mentioned this terror attack, a so-called terror attack that yeah. sounds like an anecdote that's not even sure. So what were the mechanisms leading to, to this uh, new crisis? Well, you know, we haven't mentioned Facebook. And um, the, the word internet and Facebook, the words internet and Facebook are synonyms for most Burmese. So, if you, so the country won. This, this is a simplistic, but also um, par partial answer to your question. The country went from complete dictatorship, information and information blackout, lack of telecommunications, a limited number of internet portals and access to information, um, a limited, very hard to get a cell phone, to almost complete freedom, over, actually under the end of military rule, before the elections you know, that came to power. Where people, and I saw this in Cambodia, I lived in Cambodia, Cambodia went from a place with no electricity to 3G phones. Like they skipped all the intermediate steps. Um, and Burma has done the same thing. So people were buying, were buying phones and loaded on those phones were Facebook. So um, the military first and then the NLD, um, now the military is a separate institution, the military government, then the NLD, and the military is a separate institution. All their official communications are posted on Facebook, their Facebook pages. You know, they don't put out a press release on it. Separate to that, they don't do any of it. It's posted on Facebook. If you have, a, if you buy a cell phone in Burma, Facebook is installed. You sign it for Facebook. It's almost like a phone number. And Facebook, unwittingly, was used by um, anti-Rohingya activists, which were led by the Buddhist clergy in Burma. Something called the Mabafa movement was set up um, to basically try to kick all Muslims out of the country, not just the Rohingya, all Muslims. It became very popular. They started putting up signs and, and shops, and Muslim shops, a bit like, you know, Germany in the 1930s with Jews. Um, and um, and the authorities allowed it to happen. Now, why did the authority, first the military and then the civilian authorities allow it to happen? Um, there's lots of arguments. It was hard to stop. Uh, they asked Facebook to help, and Facebook didn't respond. That's actually a footnote, not the real story. Um, but if you're the military and you're about to lose power, you start thinking of strategies to try to mobilize the population back to your side. Um, and this was a, they saw very quickly that the anti-Rohingya, anti-Muslim um, sentiment, which was bottled up under military dictatorship, like in Vietnam right now, the quickest way to get a half a million people on the streets is to hold an anti-China protest. But if you let that protest happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to bring down the Vietnamese government. So they'll let it out, the, the, that protest happen on a Monday. And in a real bad situation in the South China Sea, it'll happen on a Tuesday. And then they'll tell people, go home or go to jail. The military did this with the anti-Muslim, anti-Rohingya sentiment when, when they had power. They, they no longer had power. This started to flourish. And then they thought, oh, this is pretty good. We can exploit this. And that's why we had episodes of anti Rohingya violence that were then stopped. And in 2017, it appeared they just decided to go for broke. Um, Facebook was used, uh, it could have been some other company. So, I, I mean, I, it's, 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 I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Facebook. I don't even have a Facebook account. Um, and we fight with them from country after country. 
but it could have been any social media company, and it could have even been without Facebook, that this kind of hate would have spread um, in an unregulated environment, a new unregulated information environment. And um, and the state didn't didn't have the will um, on the military side or the ability on the civilian side to stop it or slow it down. And then comes then comes Facebook, and you say, you know, we all went to Facebook and said, you have to stop this, and they're like, it's got nothing to do with us. And they, they basically fiddled while burn up burned for a while, and then they then they kept lying and saying we were bringing up massive resources. It was like at one point it was like eight people, and they said they were bringing you know all their weight to bear and trying to shut this down. Now they have dozens, and they don't. But it's it, it's it's a bit late. So there's there's a lot of reasons, but one narrative which I don't want you to I want you to appreciate but not fully believe. I mean I can explain more, so you don't have to do what I say. But um, it, it's not it, is that a closed society opens up too quickly. You know, a dictatorship becomes a democracy, leads to anarchy, and that's what the military would have you believe, and that's what some political scientists and observers say. Uh, this is almost inevitable. No. There were a lot of choices made along the way. Um, probably this cat would have come out of the bag a bit, but not to this extent.